In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do. Through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore I ask Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to people of goodwill. We praise you, we bless you, we adore you, we glorify you, we give you thanks for your great glory, Lord God, heavenly King, O God, almighty Father, Lord Jesus Christ, only begotten Son, Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You take away the sins of the world, receive our prayer. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, have mercy on us. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and the glory of God the Father, amen. Let us pray. Almighty, ever-living God, grant that we may always conform our will to yours and serve your majesty in sincerity of heart. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. Thus says the Lord to his anointed Cyrus, whose right hand I grasp, subduing nations before him and making kings run in his service, opening doors before him and leaving gates unbarred, for the sake of Jacob, my servant of Israel, my chosen one. I have called you by your name, given you a title, though you knew me not. I am the Lord and there is no other. There is no God besides me. It is I who arm you, though you knew me not, so that towards the rising and setting of the sun, people may know there is none besides me. I am the Lord, there is no other. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Give the Lord glory and honor. Give the Lord glory and honor. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all you lands. Tell his glory among the nations, among all peoples his wondrous deeds. Give the Lord glory and honor. For great is the Lord and highly to be praised. Awesome is he beyond all gods. For all the gods of the nations are things of naught. 
But the Lord made the heavens. Give the Lord glory and honor. Give the Lord your families of nations. Give to the Lord glory and praise. Give to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring gifts and enter his courts. Give the Lord glory and honor. Worship the Lord in holy attire. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord is king. He governs the peoples with equity. Give the Lord glory and honor. The beginning of the first letter of St. Paul to the Thessalonians. Paul, Sylvanus, and Timothy to the Church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, remembering you in our prayers, unceasingly calling to mind your work of faith and labor of love and endurance in hope of our Lord Jesus Christ before God and Father, knowing, brothers and sisters, loved by God, how you were chosen. For our gospel did not come to you in word alone, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with much conviction. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. Shine like lights in the world as you hold on to the word of life. Alleluia. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. The Pharisees went off and plotted how they might entrap Jesus in speech. They sent their disciples to him with the Herodians saying, Teacher, we know that you are a truthful man and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. And you are not concerned with anyone's opinion for you do not regard a person's status. Tell us, then, what is your opinion? Is it lawful to pay the census to tax, census tax to Caesar or not? Knowing their malice, Jesus said, Why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Show me the coin that pays the census tax. Then they handed him the Roman coin. He said to them, Whose image is this in whose inscription? They replied, Caesar's. At that he said to them, Then repay to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and to God what belongs to God. The Gospel of the Lord. Tell us then, what is your opinion? 
Is it lawful to pay the census tax to Caesar or not? All right. So get ready for trivia. How well do you know your money? You use it all the time, but you may not pay attention to it very carefully. You can shout it out, and you do need to shout because you got masks on, which is great. Whose picture is on the $1 bill? George Washington. Some of you nailed it right away. Who's on the $2 bill? Uh, Thomas Jefferson. That's such a rare bill. I don't even have one to show you today. The bank didn't even have any that I could go get this afternoon. Who's on the $5 bill? Abraham Lincoln. Excellent. $10 bill? This gets tougher. Alexander Hamilton. Alexander Hamilton. Some of you have been maybe watching musicals about him recently. I don't know. What about the $20 bill? Andrew Jackson. $50 bill? Grant. Excellent. Ulysses S. Grant. $100 bill. We wish we all had more of those. Benjamin Franklin. Where did this tradition come from, putting the different images of our presidents on dollar bills? It goes back to ancient times, and we hear about it in the gospel tonight, but it's fascinating. American currency is very different than with the context we're going to hear about this evening. Why? Because Alexander Hamilton wasn't a president. Benjamin Franklin wasn't a president. Not everybody on here is a president because we don't worship our presidents or emperors or kings or leaders as gods. But that was very different in the time of Christ. In the Greco-Roman world, the Kaisers, the Caesars, begin to declare themselves in an apotheosis that they are actually God. And even if people don't believe it in actual ritual and worship, they better play the pretense of it because it could mean your life if you don't really worship the God. Who is the emperor at the time of Christ? We have Tiberius. Tiberius, who's the son to Augustus. Tiberius is the emperor. And I'm getting ahead of myself. Look at the gospel then today. So first of all, we have the Pharisees who think of themselves as authentically interpreting the law. And so they can't get Jesus. They've tried a couple different ways. So they enlist the help of the Herodians. Who are the Herodians? The Herodians are those who basically are still Jews and they're basically courtiers of Herod Antipas, right, who's the Jewish king of the area, but not pretty faithful at all to the Jewish religion or worship. The Herodians are not a religious group. The Herodians are a political party. And the Herodians have allied themselves with Rome, not because they have any love for the Romans, but they're pragmatists, and they know that it'll go well for them, they'll be benefited if they kind of make peace, right, with the Romans, the occupiers of the Holy Land of Israel. So the Herodians, when they come up, again, notice, they're trying to test Jesus. This is not authentic. They're not coming to Christ out of love, and they're trying to embarrass him in three different ways. We don't see it in our English, but when they say teacher, remember again, that's rabboni, that's rabbi. That's a sacred office. That's the office of the Pharisees, somebody who can authentically interpret the law of God. So they're setting him up because they're basically saying they're gonna test his authority by the answer of his question, if he'll know the right answer. And they must be asking this very question about paying the census tax to Caesar because somewhere along the line they've gotten an inkling, at least a hint from Jesus, that maybe he's saying not to. So they're going to prey on that. Why? So they can question his authority. Secondly, they're going to invoke him in a sense to use scripture. So they're saying, tell us lawfully, is it? So tell us from scripture the five books the first five books of the Old Testament, the Torah, the most sacred books, tell us where it says from that whether we should pay the taxes to Caesar or not. And again, having an inkling that Jesus might say, no, don't pay Caesar, ah, they've got him, and they can go to the Roman authorities ahead of Good Friday. Keep in mind, by the way, this is happening, this episode of the gospel is happening in Holy Week, right after Palm Sunday, right after many different Jewish men and women recognized him as a king as he came on on the foal of an ass, right, into Jerusalem like another David. So if the Romans hear that this guy is saying don't pay the taxes, he's a threat to the real emperor. He's declaring himself a king. He's going to create revolution and uprising. We can get him. 
If he says to pay the temple taxes, oh, he's not a really faithful Jew because a faithful Jew would know you give honor to God and to our religion and the, the Romans don't really own the Holy Land. We do. God gave it to us as a gift. He's not a very good rabbi or teacher or member of the law. They've got him trapped, except they don't because Jesus is Jesus. What does Jesus brilliantly do? He doesn't give an answer, yes or no. He counters with a question. Something we should learn for rhetoric, I think sometimes when people ask us a hard question, maybe be cautious, we don't fall in their trap, but just kind of pose back, well, what do you mean by that? Right, even that simple kind of gesture throws back in there, they have to explain, right, a loaded question. Jesus offers this brilliant answer which exposes the original intention and question's vulnerability but also the Herodians themselves. Why? Because Jesus says what? He says, show me one of the coins. Whose image is this and whose inscription? Now Jesus knows what a denarius, which is a silver Roman coin worth about a day's wage, he knows what's on it. So why is he asking to actually see one? He doesn't have any on him. Because to have a denarius is to say, because of the image that's on it, and the use of it, that you're basically in league with the Romans. See, the emperor forbade people to even take the coin that bore his image to you bring it into the bathroom or into a brothel. Just a note, you should never go into a brothel. You probably have to go in the bathroom. But because his image is so holy and he's to be worshiped and he is the emperor God, to even bring his image into a foul place could lead to drastic consequences, an act of irreverence to his holiness. So the fact that the Herodians can quickly expose that they use that currency means the Herodians really are sellouts themselves. They don't want an answer. They're already using Roman currency. They know where it comes from, Lyon and Gaul, which is now France. They know that when the census tax is to be paid, you actually have to pay more money if you use a different currency than that of the Roman Empire. They tax you even higher if you use your own, shekels or whatnot. So he's exposing them to already be in the party of politics, not caring about truth, but already lining themselves up with the Romans, even though they don't like them, but for practical purposes. It's politically advantageous. Plus, Jesus does two things. He says, whose image is on the coin and what's the inscription? This is really telling. For any good Jew, they know instantly when they hear that image on the coin, it would bring them back to that first commandment, you shall not have any graven images of false gods. Hmm. You're asking me about the false god? Already laden, laden in Jesus' response is already his response. This is a false god who thinks he's God. And then when he says the inscription, the inscription that's written actually on a denarius, and I had to look this part up, but it actually says, um, it has a picture, so it has Tiberius like in profile, right? They all are so good looking with their aquiline noses and so forth. Then on the back it has the Roman empress of peace, right, a goddess of peace. And around it says Pontiff Maxim, an abbreviation for Pontifus Maximus, which means high priest. And around Tiberius, going around his part, it says Tiberius Caesar, worshipful son of the god Augustus. Do you see the painful irony that the actual son of God, who is the bringer of real peace that surpasses understanding, is holding this trinket of silver that claims to be the son of God, that claims to be the peace bringer? Jesus has such a good sense of humor. Inscription that's written on it would lead to a Jew who hears that, the inscription that they bear in leather pouches upon their forehead and upon their wrist. If you ever go to a Jewish house and you see the little, um, forgive me, I don't know the name of it uh, at this moment, but there's a little kind of metal thing that holds written scripture, a little Torah inside, and they touch it and pray with it. It's called the, the Shema, Shema. It's a prayer that's unique to the Jews, but also to us as Christians, because it comes from their Bible, our Old Testament. But what does it say? It says, hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. 
Notice what's happening. Jesus is saying the image, right, have no false images of false gods. The emperor's claiming to be a god and you're consorting with him. And the inscription is that I am the real son of God. I am the one who truly liberates you and gives you peace. And I am the only God. This whole gospel sometimes is misunderstood by people for their own uses as a very simple like, see, Jesus said to pay the taxes. Actually, that doesn't seem to be what he's saying. Now, that's not saying that we don't pay taxes, and I'll explain that in a minute. But in this context, Jesus is setting forth two opposites, polar opposites. You cannot have allegiance to the emperor God, to the world here, to the money that's even printed on, and still claim that you have as the one true God, the only God, the true God of Israel. And for us, that holy trinity. So what does Jesus then respond? He says, render unto Caesar what's Caesar's and render unto God what's God's. Does anything really belong to Caesar? For the Jewish mind who knows the true God, God made everything, the whole world belongs to him. They don't even own the Holy Land or Israel. Yes, they claim claim it, but because God gave it to them as a promise. It's the Lord who leases out the world to us. That's why every parable is about a steward right? We're the stewards. We get to manage and use the things he gives, but we're never the king or the owner or the boss. The emperor thinks the land and the people belong to him, that everyone who makes transactions with his money, with his image on it, need to worship him, belong to him, and that he's the source of peace and political stability and economic stability and security. But the two are mutually exclusive, You either worship the one true God or the false God. There's no in between. So Jesus is asking us in a very subtle, beautiful way, where's our allegiance? Yes, we pray for our emperors or kings or presidents, whatever form of government it is. That's out of actually the New Testament. But why? Because the better human beings they are, the better off we're gonna be. So for our own peace and security, we better darn well pay, pray for the Congress and judges, the president, other governments, for peace in the world, for wisdom among leaders, even local leaders, mayors and people who work for MUD even, or OPP. We need people to be morally righteous people because they're gonna make decisions on our behalf that are gonna affect everybody. So we pray for that. And yes, we do pay our, pay our taxes, which is in the catechism, The catechism says, for the sake of the common good, we do participate in that public, right, help to other peoples and the government we belong to, the nation we are members of. But isn't it interesting in the catechism, they don't quote this passage. In fact, this passage in the catechism is used in only one place. It's used when to justify acts of civil disobedience. It quotes the gospel from today to teach that a Christian must refuse to obey political authority when that political authority makes a demand contrary to the demands of the moral order, the fundamental rights of persons, or the teachings of the gospel. Moreover, the catechism goes on to instruct us that a person should not submit his personal freedom in an absolute manner to any earthly power, but only to God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Caesar is not the Lord, the catechism ends this paragraph. So where do you sit two weeks out from a very highly charged election? Are you a diehard Republican? Are you a diehard Democrat? Your parents were always Republican. Your parents were always Democrat. Your parents were the opposite, and so you'll never be what your parents are, so you will always be the opposite. I'm an American before anything else. Are those the things that we worship? Or are we Christians? Is our God the God who transcends political parties? Both might have good ideas here or there, but none of them are our savior. When push comes to shove, how many times have we been told as Christians, especially in the United States, to not just respect but revere the separation of church and state? Don't you dare impart your personal beliefs on the rest of the people. Is that what the founders, all these different guys, fought for? They're on the money? 
It was for religious freedom they came to North America, to the New World. It was because they could see that religion and reason could work together. They might all have been Christians, they might have been deists, I don't know. But in our Constitution, in that Bill of Rights, there's a fundamental idea that all men are treated equally because they have inalienable rights given by God, not the emperor, not the king, not the president. God is the top one. God is what creates the reason why we even have a democracy or the freedoms that we cherish and defend. Brothers and sisters, when the spirit works in your mind, do your research. Don't vote on personalities. Don't vote just on parties and allegiances. Vote on character and vote on who will actually promote that dignity of every human being, their right to life, that will accord laws that are in accord with our gospel, not our personal beliefs, not our whims, not what the world says. Often we have those bullying tactics, not just from outside, but even us as Catholic Christians. We're so silent sometimes. We don't want to offend anybody. Jesus was certainly nuanced in his response today, but he tells a bold truth. He doesn't say you can have both, either God or the world. You can't play it both ways. So let's be Christians first when we make those votes and mail them in or come into the polling place. What is our church? That's our party, not a political one, but a family party. Archbishop Chaput, who wrote a beautiful book back in 2009 called Render Unto Caesar about Christians and specifically Catholics and political life, I'd encourage anyone to read it. He says this beautiful thing in the introduction, people who take God seriously will not remain silent about their faith. They will often disagree about doctrine or policy, but they won't be quiet. They can't be. They'll act on what they believe, sometimes at the cost of their reputations and careers. Obviously, the common good demands a respect for other people with different beliefs and a willingness to compromise whenever possible. But for Catholics, the common good can never mean muting themselves in public debate on foundational issues of faith or human dignity. Christian faith is always personal, but never private. This is why any notion of tolerance that tries to reduce faith to a private idiosyncrasy or a set of opinions that we can indulge at home but need to be quiet about in public will always fail. As a friend once said, it's like asking a married man to act single in public. He can certainly do that, but he won't stay married for long. Look at Amy Coney Barrett and how many times she was questioned just because she's a Catholic. Can we not have religion and be a citizen? Can we not even be a better citizen because of our faith, because we're fervent, because we want the common good that Jesus desires? So brothers and sisters, do we worship the men on this currency? We do not. America's pretty unique. We don't believe in tyrants. We don't believe in those things. We believe in a body that represents the people and goodness. But isn't it interesting that on these dollar bills, if we do look at the images or inscriptions on the back, this one says, Anuit Cheptis, God has favored our undertakings. There's an image of an eye, right? Not just Masonic or something, it means God. God is watching over the country. And on every single one of these bills, there's one common inscription, in God we trust. Let's look to our money to actually be catechized then. We don't worship Ben Franklin or Andrew Jackson or Abraham Lincoln, but we do worship God in whom we trust. May the Lord be blessed. Amen. I'm taking my money with me so nobody comes and takes it after. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, 
maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Confident in the Father's love, we lift up our prayers and needs to him. For the laity, may they engage with the world and imbue our family's culture in body and politic and faith with faith, hope, charity, and love. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. We pray for all those who are in authority and all those running for office so that they may lead a tranquil and quiet life in all godliness and dignity. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. In this Respect Life month of October, we pray that everyone will recognize the image of God in every human being from concession through natural death. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For those in the legal profession and all judges, may they rule and act in honesty and impartiality. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For our police, firefighters, and EM EMTs, may first responders be protected in their work and rewarded for their selflessness. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all those in the medical professions, may St. Luke intercede for those who attend to the sick and suffering and shield them from illness. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the ill and infirm, may the Lord bolster their spirits, heal them, and fill them with hope. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For generosity to the Archbishop's annual appeal and to charitable works, may we, re we, may we respond to God's gifts by sharing them with others. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the intentions we hold in the silence of our hearts. And for all those who have died, especially John Teft, father to parishioner Susan Tuzan, and little Angelo Nicholas Pica, baby son to parishioners Mark and Amy Pica. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Loving Father, your gospel did not come to us in word alone, but in power in the Holy Spirit. Incite us to proclaim your good news in deed and word and hear these prayers through your Son, Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Masses celebrated here at Christ King this weekend are offered for the repose of the soul of Karen Ewer, the well-being of the people of Christ the King Parish, the living and deceased members of the Catholic Daughters, the eternal repose of Vito Privatera, the repose of the soul of Oral Jim Olson, and an increase in vocations to the priesthood and consecrated religious life.
pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the Lord accept, accept the sacrifice at your hands, the, the praise and glory of his name, for our good and good of all his holy church. Grant us, Lord, we pray, a sincere respect for your gifts, that through the purifying action of your grace, we may be cleansed by the very mysteries we serve through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks. Father most holy, through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, your word through whom you made all things, whom you sent as our Savior and Redeemer, incarnate by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin. Fulfilling your will and gaining for you a holy people, he stretched out his hands as he endured his passion, so as to break the bonds of death and manifest the resurrection. And so, with the angels and all the saints, we declare your glory as with one voice we acclaim. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them, like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord, Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and, giving thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice and, once more, giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith, save us, Savior of the world, for by your cross and resurrection you have set us free. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity together with Francis, our Pope, and George, our Bishop, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the blessed apostles, and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Through 
through him and with him and in him. O God, almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. body and blood of Christ. Amen. We join those who did not receive communion today for any reason with a prayer of spiritual communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are in the Blessed Sacrament. I love you above all things, and I long for you in my soul. Since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. As though you have already come, I embrace you and unite myself entirely to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Let us pray. Grant, O Lord, we pray, that benefiting from participation in heavenly things, we may be helped by what you give in this present age and prepared for the gifts that are eternal through Christ our Lord. Amen. A few quick announcements. Thanks to all of you who have supported the Archbishop's annual appeal through prayer and meaningful gifts. This weekend again, like last, we invite everyone who have yet to make a gift to join fellow parishioners in expression of gratitude. Every gift, no matter how large or small, makes a difference. Our parish has currently committed a little over $72,000, nothing to laugh at, towards our parish goal of $175,000. So we still got a ways to go though. 
Only 12% of our parish households so far have participated in the appeal, so we do have longer, uh, we have more to do with participation as well. So please, if you'd use the materials the Archbishop mailed to you to make a pledge of prayer support or a financial gift, you decide the amount with your conscience or even just to give prayers, but we can all mail back in at least the cost of a stamp some way to participate with a larger church. EPS is having its annual baby bottle drive. You can help mothers and fathers in difficult situations choose life for their children and rear those children. You can come to the North Hallway where there's bottles and there's directions on how to fill currency in them and to be able to support that grand mission. Like always, again, in these remarkable times, it's a tremendous gift to see all of you here at Mass. So thanks for your extra effort and your love of Jesus. I hope you're feeling God's love for you and hope in your hearts. As you do leave tonight, we would ask you, please take a bulletin and read it. Honestly, it's the only way I can communicate effectively to everybody, so please take one. And if you would consider leaving a Sunday donation in one of the five blue baskets as you depart, that's most appreciated. Who do we worship? false gods of this world, or the one true God who made us in his image, the image of love. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Go and announce the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Saint Michael, the archangel, defend us in battle. Be our protection against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the heavenly hosts, by the power of God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. Proceed.